Sleep like Jack. Good eye, Mike. Let's see. It usually is a bit of a lag, so obviously we'll we'll just muck around for a little bit. Hopefully this live connection holds up, and we'll just muck around for a bit, maybe two or three minutes, before we get into the theme of today's live, which is the raised garden beds. And then once we've got some people on board, more people on board, then we'll uh, get stuck into it. First of all, can you hear me okay? There's a bit of a lag between my computer and live. Probably, I reckon, 20 seconds, which is a little odd from my end. Loud and clear from Toby. Ahoy, Tegan. Morgan, yes. Yep, we can hear you, Shannon. Good morning. Yes, you sound great, La. Hi, Deborah from Florida. Floridians. See? I remembered. Floridians. Well, I think that's right, isn't it? Floridians. I cocked that. I cocked it. I cocked, speaking of cocking up, did you hear that cockatoo coming over? Morning from central Queensland, caveman farmer, James Lismore, Justin, Teresa from Melbourne, Germany, Kim from Colorado, We've got Epic Gardening. <laughs> Mark is the man. <laughs> hey Kevin, thanks for tuning in, mate. Uh, you're a card. You've been doing well. Your YouTube channel's fantastic, especially your new place. You know, and the in-ground gardening I saw you do the other day. Loving it. Tomato tips. I've got a few of them as well. I'm going to try that weaving. Um, that weaving thing behind me over here I've got some of these there uh, what do I call them? Roamers and I've got some recycled plastic uh, posts or, or instead of using um, wooden stakes they're recycled plastic made from uh, their uh, not sponsored or anything or even affiliated, but um, Plastic Forests make them in Albury here in Australia. And they they make them out of Mars bar wrappers and soft plastics, which used to be really hard to do. There's only a few in the world that can do this. But it's growing, which is good, because soft plastics, like plastic bags and that type of thing, is probably one of the worst plastics in the world that gets into the oceans and all that. And if we can start getting an incentive to start recycling that stuff that's great but anyway those I want to stake those tomatoes with these big eight foot are they eight foot no they're probably seven or so foot stakes they're quite thick they'll last forever and they've got holes through them so I can do your weaving thing by putting the twine through those holes once I've staked those those Roma tomatoes so I'm looking forward to doing that Calvin, Aubrey, speaking of Aubrey, Mike from Caboolture, hey Mike, Kirsty from California, I'm trying to get through every second one, even though we're on go slow mode, slow mo mode, uh, it's still racing through, which is great, that means there's a few people tuning in. So I think we can get into the theme. We've nearly fucked to five minutes. And uh, I just come back 
to look at myself coming back. It's quite weird, but anyway, I think we can get into it. Now, what are the stats? We've got, you know, 562 people currently watching, so that's pretty cool. So, let's get into the theme of it. Why am I building more raised garden beds? Well, because who doesn't need more raised garden beds? Really? I've got nine birdies. Now, birdies isn't sponsored. In fact, I bought these myself. Um, but I do have an affiliate ship with birdies. And speaking about Kevin from Epic Gardening, uh, he sells these birdies raised garden beds as well. Specifically the ones behind me and the round ones over in the States. And I also have an affiliate arrangement with birdies in Australia and New Zealand. So which means if you go down to the description, you'll find the affiliate code, which gives you a discount if you're gonna buy any of these types of garden beds. Um, and yeah, whether you build them or buy them, I think raised gardening, you know, is the way to go for lots of people. Even if you are still growing in ground, it's nice to have these big planters. They're like big planters. Uh, now I'm conscious of the sun behind me. It's the only spot I can put this camera at the moment. So I might, you know, might get a bit of wash out or you might find that my face is a bit dark can't help that i apologize for that but anyway what can you do i'll get this wireless thing fixed up it's a miracle that we've actually got this streaming and it's uh still an excellent connection uh so it's it's great but um but yeah whether you're whether you're growing you know you've got most of your crops in ground it's still nice to have some raised garden beds strawberries is one of them I mean, whether that's a big barrel, half a barrel, or one of these raised garden beds that you have strawberries in, the reason why it's good is that it displays nicely. The strawberries can then grow and flow over the edge. It also keeps the pests down because there's less pests that get, at, get into them, and there's less chance of critters on the ground like, like rats and mice getting into them as well because simply they have to get up there. I know it doesn't stop them all the time, but it does help um, and other types of animals that might just get into your strawberries if they're on ground. So yeah, but that's not the only, I try to grow everything above ground except for pumpkins. Um, and a few other things of course, like my about 150 fruit trees and you know, pigeon pea and some of those shrubs. But uh, yeah, who's counting? Yeah, so um, what I was speaking about, yeah, if those affiliate codes and everything are down below, but they're not sponsored. Um, and I do prefer to pay, and I use my affiliate code to get a discount. So I think it's five, yeah, it's a 5% discount. So uh, yeah, why not? So I do get the discount like everyone else, which is pretty cool. But why more? Well, there's a few reasons. Firstly, like I said, I want an empire build and I want more raised garden beds because I like growing in them and I'm finding that I'm running out of space to do what I want to do. Like for example, garlic is one thing that it's a crop that it's difficult to crowd grow. I've tried crowd growing it in the past and it does better when you space them out at least around 25 centimeters apart. And onions you can get closer and I've done that before but garlic seems to like its space a little bit um, to, to grow really well. So if I'm growing garlic this year and I wanted to grow a ton of it, I, I've got other crops that are sort of um, creeping over uh, from season to season. So I've got some crops um, like, for example, the pumpkin, um, the Jerusalem artichoke, that, that I've, they've died off now, but they were, they crept into the new growing season and they took up that garden bed space. So to get that amount of garlic that I wanted to grow, I, want, I would like another couple of round raised garden beds or extra gardening space to grow even more. I want to also grow in different places under different conditions using different fertilizers, 
different amounts of watering so I can test to see what's best and then I can make those notes usually video notes and understand what grows best how and under what conditions when under what's the best fertilizer how much fertilizer what's the best watering I got a great watering tip the other day well it was last October by a, the, a guy who grows garlic not far from us but he grows it commercially beautiful purple Glen garlic really nice big beautiful things still got plenty of it I brought a whole box of it hundred bucks worth of garlic which is still cheap it worked out to be I think about 20 bucks a kilo if you buy it in bulk whereas you can buy you can buy it at the shops um, for a lot lot more than that up to 30 or 40 dollars if you're buying it depending on how you're buying it and you know you wouldn't touch the stuff from China the bleach stuff that'd be ridiculous so I like this organic natural stuff and uh, but also I'm using it as seed garlic and that's what I've planted this time because it grows well in our area and it's proven so but anyway getting to the really big tip that he gave us was on his farm he noticed that with the irrigation system he's got he has got a drip irrigation system in but he noticed it's on a slight hill and the garlic that was down the bottom of the hill where most where the water ran down and it got most of the water grew the best and he was a bit shocked and I'm a bit shocked too because you'd think well you don't want to overwater a onion or a garlic because you might rot the root and that type of thing that is something that gives me the heebie-jeebies whereas he found out that the, those that had a little bit extra water did better so now he's increasing his watering overall you know to improve that harvest so that I thought that was a really interesting tip that he gave me um, but anyway getting back to the raised bed so I wanted more space I wanted to experiment more the crossover seasons was another reason and then of course my old wooden raised garden beds they're all slowly going kaputzes so that's I replaced those big four there I replaced a rotten wooden long trellis type raised garden bed which is about a foot high if that made from old sleepers and I replaced it with those four raised garden beds there and so now I built these two but this one and this one from our decking wood or the the rail that went around our front our back deck but I didn't have enough to do a third one in the middle here so I, I built this one yesterday I'll show it to you either on my second channel or on this one um, but I did a time lapse of it and I did a bit of filming that one there is 2.5 meters by 1.2 meters wide so fairly long but not too wide because you don't want to be you, you want to reach the middle of your garden bed you, you never want to be uh, having to try to um, you know swim on top of your garden bed to get in there or if you've got a small garden bed you don't want to be walking in there and compacting the soil and just it's a pain in the ass trying to weed the plants from the middle is difficult if it's too wide and I've learnt all that over the years so I was determined to make sure that I didn't go past the 1.2 because then from either side you can reach the middle easier to weed easier to plant easier to manage uh, don't have to bend the back as much and that type of thing so I've put one there and I, I, I got one the cream color I forget what it's called but it's a sort of cream color just to match the same paint job as the other two doesn't have to match really I'm not that pedantic about the garden beds but um, and the rest of them I've got a misty misty color but this one here you'll see it's only it's quite thin and it's uh, it's only 500 mil wide and uh, the reason for that is because I built those garden beds there, the, the fairly wide ones, 
from the, the old decking material. And I used to have in that spot these big square sleeper things. If you follow my, my videos, you'd know that I had these big square beds when I first moved here. I just plonked down two by four by two by four. And uh, we used that for a while. I realized that you couldn't get into the middle of the bed. So I thought, well, what do I do? This is crazy. I can't reach the middle. So I put, I put um, some bricks and pavers in the middle, put some pot plants in the middle on some of them to use up that space. And then realized that that was stupid because then I have to get in there to maintain the pots. And so I ended up cutting keyholes into those beds. And I've got a video on how I did that. Some of the footage is taken from the top of my shed looking down, which is pretty cool. But then after that, the beds fell apart anyway. Over time, 10 years, the wood rotted. And so I pulled them all apart, rebuilt these ones from recycled timber. And now I've got that other birdies bed in the middle there, Alu, Alu Zinc. And that should last for 30 years or more. And where was I going with this? Um, I'll get to your questions and everything like that in the in the second sort of half. If uh, well, after I've gone through the reason why I'm getting these new raised garden beds um, and mumbling on a bit and going on tangents. But. Uh, Yeah, come on, come on, think. I'm getting mesmerized by your staring. Um, yes, yes, that's right. So it was pushing, so I built them and it's pushing out and getting too wide. And, and I did have these big ones in there. So there's the space, but there's not enough space for two of those wide ones so I thought I don't want to waste that space in there and you can get these ones here in Australia anyway at all different types of sizes and so I got four of these thinner ones and they're 2.5 long by 500 wide and so half a meter wide so what's that one and a half feet wide or something like that and that will go a nice strip down this side. Down this side here. Which will still give me some space for a wheelbarrow and space to walk down. Did you like my jog? Did I, like, did I look like Biden? Anyway, yeah, so I think that'll work really well there. And that's good that you can get them in those different widths and that to fill in those kind of spaces. And then behind all that near my, well, now it's a pumpkin trellis, but it used to be a, a gourd tunnel. Near that, I've got this strip. And I've talked about that quite a few times on my channel. Um, that's another old uh, wooden one. We've got a helicopter coming over. Now this is quite busy in the, in the old, um, aircraft department this morning but that, that those guys are probably just making sure that my live streams running okay hovering over everything okay down there mark yeah that's all right you can go now i've just got to get this computer running again as we wait for this helicopter to go over. I don't know why, I, there must be a way I can lock the screen on this thing. Yeah, so that garden bed, then over that side, it's a really long one. 
and I'm gonna take that apart it's just about rotted to pieces anyway and then I'm going going to build and I've still got to build them I've only built two so far another four similar to these ones or actually similar to the one in the middle exactly the same actually except they're a misty color so misty green similar to these colors and they'll go along that side and there'll be four of them which you know 2.5 meters long gets you around 10 meters or so I'll butt them up pretty close like I have done here and then it'll be pretty much all that garden space then will be changed over to raised bed gardens and then over the other side of the gourd tunnel there's a space there you can't see it now because the pumpkin vine has taken over the whole place but I'm gonna once I cut that down and give it a little bit more life I mean we are getting pretty sick of pumpkin I store a few more give a few more away uh, then I'll get rid of that and I'm going to put some I've got about four more plastic forests recycled um, raised round garden beds made from coffee cups and those types of things and I'm going to make them up and put them along the back so I'm gonna have then quite a few different styles of garden beds that I can show you throughout videos and perhaps even do a video on the different types of garden beds which I'll have several of or as displays here um, plus anything that I have had in the past that I can drag up some old footage and sort of give an insight to where I've been and perhaps you know and the mistakes I've made so other people can can learn from that and uh, and get a jump on it when they when they start gardening if they come across my videos yeah so that's the reasons so let's get into a bit of Q&A then I just uh, what's the time I started a little bit later this morning just so I could get the boys off to school and have a bit more time to set this live stream up without being overly rushed and I think that's that's good 9 30 here Australian time Eastern Standard uh, it's working pretty good so maybe we get into a bit of Q&A Have I used aspirin with my tomatoes? I haven't. I've heard people do that. I don't. I don't know. I, it's probably nothing wrong with it. I've read about it. Uh, I just don't like the the idea um, of using medication to to help with tomatoes. Plus the fact that my tomatoes don't really suffer from anything. Occasionally, certain tomatoes will get viruses or get attacked by nematodes more in our garden beds primarily the, the the cherry pear type and they must be more susceptible than other varieties of tomatoes because i can plant them next to other tomatoes and the other tomatoes will thrive and the pear shaped ones they will grow really good for a bit and then they'll start wilting and if you, know, you go through the steps is it getting enough water um, is is there a pest something is something eating the, the 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 stems or is there aphids or and you, and you find out in the end that it's either nematodes attacking the roots or they get a virus that must be in my property um, and they they cark it really quick they'll get to almost the fruiting stage sometimes they'll they'll have some fruit and then they'll just be flat out limp dead uh, while other tomatoes around are going okay. But apart from that, there's really not many problems we have with tomatoes. You have to be quite forgiving with tomatoes. Tomatoes can start dying off from the base of the plant, and that's just quite normal. People can go, oh no, my tomato, it's like new growers can start thinking, oh, my tomato plants are failing. They're getting leaf diseases. Oh, I've got to, uh, I've got to you know, fill them full of chemicals and all that. Well, usually just a bit of pruning you know, off the base of the plant and some and just to air the plant out a bit can be suffice to help those tomatoes but the aspirin thing not not needed and a little bit I'm a little bit I just wouldn't do it since that because it's a medication it's just a kind of bit weird
Uh, are you talking about dirt in the containers? Are you talking about my containers? Like that, that's a raised garden bed. But, but yeah, there's not just dirt in them. If you go back and have a look at some of my videos, um, how to fill a raised garden bed or Hugel culture on my channel, search in the video section, you'll find that these beds here are, are, are used, um, are filled using the Hugel culture type style. Whereas I've got all sorts of things in the bottom, all organic matter, including logs and larger materials that will take years to break down, but become home for fungi and insects and animals and worms, provide food for worms when they migrate down through winter or if, <clears throat> or if they need to go and f search for something to eat more if the beds are haven't had much of attention or a lot of compost put in for a while, you find the worms will go seeking something to chew on, you know. So I'd like to fill all of these raised garden beds using the Hugo culture method. Uh, if you don't have logs and stuff like that, you can fill them full of wood chip in the base. You can fill them full of all sorts of garden waste, anything, bunches of weeds and all that right in the base, pushed down. Look, even if they've gone to seed, because you're never going to dig them back up. Um, and then, if you put a say half soil on top of that, you will find that that'll start sinking down because the light matter, even wood chip, will decay pretty quickly. And when those beds sink, you just keep layering them on, filling them full of compost, uh, maybe some more dirt if you need to. But usually, it's fine to fill them with organic matter and then plant into them and then they sink and they keep sinking. They also, you also lose matter through harvesting, pulling weeds and that type of thing. You slowly lose matter from a bed and the beds will slowly sink down. So you're in this constant cycle of renewing it and which is a good thing. You're renewing and you're keeping the bed alive with compost and good organic matter, fertilizer, um, manures and that type of thing. And then over time, you're building those beds into really a really special medium that plants just love and thrive in. See you, Tony. Night, mate. Thanks for popping in. I believe I caught the end of that. I believe that was Tony from Simplify Gardening. Nice chat. Good gardening channel. Over in the UK there. Oh, I take the screensaver off, hey? Before going live. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. That's, uh, what is that, down under gardening? With metal, Robert. The, the dirt doesn't heat up. Look, think of it as a mound. As a mound of of dirt, so take away the metal around them and think of it as just one big pile of soil. It takes a heck of a lot to heat that up. And uh, even in our subtropical climate, it gets heck hot here through summer, like I'm talking 40 degrees Celsius. Those, those beds don't heat up. The outside of the beds might, so if you planted, that's the reason why I will plant about at least three to four inches away from the sides of the bed because if you planted right there, I mean the roots are going to be, it's like if you planted right on the edge of a, of a container or a pot, you know, a small garden pot, you'd plant in the middle. Um, otherwise you could get some burn on the roots on the outside if that plant's rooted out and, and it's got some on the outside it mightn't matter so much because a lot of it's on the inside, a lot of the root growth, but that's the only thing I could think of. And even then, uh, I don't have much of a problem at all with beds heating up 
mm. un unless you use them like a compost pile, then then yeah. I mean, what I mean by that is you could use something like this to throw a whole heap of organic matter in. And if you've got too much organic matter and not enough soil and heavier mass, well then it's going to be breaking down as that breaks down. That's going to heat those beds up considerably. But if you've got a sort of half-half mix, like if you've got the Hugo culture logs and that in the base and then soil and compost and that on top, you're, you're not going to get any problems from heat at all. That's a bit of a myth that goes around that these metal beds heat up or something like that. It doesn't. Greetings from Central Florida. Bees, cheeses and wine please. Bees, cheese and wine please. Well yeah, that's a good combination. Great combination. I need to make a book because it would sell like hot potatoes from Lance Smith. Yeah, if I could find the time. I mean, I, I, um, I really love doing videos and I really, I haven't even had a chance to write an, any more, a, a, a lot of articles lately. So, I, I need to organize my time a lot better and uh, writing a book would be pretty fun would be good I've had a bit of interest in, in, in publishers and that talking to me about it so it's it'll be on the cards one day I think I've still got for quite a fair bit of experimentation to do before I get to a book but um, yeah because I don't want to write a book just because you know at the moment my channel's going well and and it could be quite popular um, not to write it for money. Uh, I, I'd like to make sure if I wrote a book that it was quite comprehensive, fun to read, but had some really good tips that I back up from experimentation in the garden. So I could show people exactly what I'm talking about and why these, why this gardening book might be different than some than some others. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, hopefully sell well too and not be a waste of time. But yeah, no, I appreciate the sentiment though that I could write a book and it'd do well. G'day, we three or W three believe from Alabama. Well, no, yeah, Alabama. Living Simple Homestead. Thanks for going live, brother. You're a wealth of knowledge. Oh, I don't know about a wealth of knowledge, but yeah, like I was just saying, I like experimenting and uh, people seem to enjoy that type of thing. I've got a few good experiments coming up. They take a while to do, um, but uh, no, I appreciate that. No, thank you very much. Howdy from Orlando, Florida. Paul Kish. Howdy. G'day from Chile, New South Wales. Is it cold down there at the moment? Oh, it probably could be. Yeah, yeah, in certain parts for sure. Well, here I've got to suck the water down and look at the sweat beading on my forehead. Got to keep wiping it out of my eyes. Sun's beautiful though. It's a really lovely morning here. And if it wasn't for some of those planes flying over and helicopters, it would be really peaceful and quiet. Birds. Jamie, you caught me live first time, hey? Thank you.
pepper geek. What's my favourite pepper? Like hot pepper or or other pepper? Let's say let's go both. Um, I like the big uh, the big fat juicy sweet peppers. Um, the bigger the better. The smaller ones are a bit more finicky. They're okay, and I've I've tried the generic peppers before as well. The wild ones that probably the rest are based off and they grow a bit like a large chili like a pablo chili and they're not hot but they they're a bit bitter i like the the larger sweet ones i like them roasted or, or over a over a fire and grilled um, i like them in an antipasto as well but as far as hot chilies go I, it's hard to go it's hard to go by the bird's eyes for that flavor and hit uh, but then uh, there's lots that I like I like a jalapeno and that style of of hot chili and hot pepper and habaneros as well because they're they're hot but they're also they're tangy and quite tasty and you can take the seeds out and get a really nice hot sauce but not something that blows your head off um, and I'm gonna actually be making they're behind me here. I don't think you, you guys can see them. Uh, no, you can't. But these, they, I, it's time. It's, it's not the end of the road yet. But if I leave it too late, these, these chilies will start to be getting uh, too too old so they're perfect right now they're at their peak lovely and these are cherry tomatoes so they're growing side by side and what I want to do is make up make up a a chili sauce from the cherry tomatoes and these combined a bit of garlic maybe some chopped onion fry that up grill that a little bit get a good flavor going blend it up you know add some vinegar and uh, a few herbs and spices and then make a really nice sauce out of it probably a squeeze of lemon juice got plenty of lemons and uh, make up sort of make it up from just out of my head a little bit of sugar and salt because that helps with flavor to balance flavors from the acidity but also it helps with preserving and uh, yeah you can make some wonderful sauces just by through your imagination in the backyard and, and tasting. So if you're adding salt and a little bit of sugar, not too much, but you wanna not add a whole heap unless you've got a set, set recipe that you know from the past. But if you're not sure, I just add a bit and a bit and I keep tasting and tasting the mix, even the tomato chili mix, and just uh, see if it needs a little bit more, maybe tomato to add some, to, to thin it out a little bit, maybe it's too overwhelming. And then when I get the balance right, then I can I can cook it up, boil it up, and then strain it and bottle it. And that's how I make a lot of our sauces. It's not off any particular recipe. It's just sort of based on the same type of recipe, but a lot of the time it's just trial and error. And most of the time they turn out fantastic. So I've got to get onto that really soon. And maybe in the next few days. Otherwise, you, you leave your chilies, your hot peppers and that go past the years by, they start getting soft and it starts, you start losing the flavor and, and they get, you know, pretty much ready to just be used as seed for next season. You don't want that. I mean, you want some for seed for next season. Step. Hello from Atlanta, USA. Love your videos. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Step. I don't have a Kwandong jam recipe, no. I have tried tiny tim tomatoes yes uh, that was one of my first tomatoes i ever grew and a lot of these 
throwbacks or ones that just pop up in the garden now that I transplant or leave grow where they grow, like the one I just showed you, they're based on Tiny Tim's. The larger cherry tomatoes that just come up now willy-nilly, so I hardly ever have to plant cherry tomatoes anymore uh, unless I really want a special variety, like the white ones, I've grown them before, and the, the black crim. Um, but yeah, I just still like these standard ones that come up in the garden, they're just fantastic. Okay, crikey, what's going on here? Kevin? You just dropped that one in there, mate. Thank you very much, Kevin. Jeeps. Two percent. Thank you. Hello, Mark. I'm here in hot California. How's Scooter? Hot California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can get pretty warm there. When we were there, it was uh, it was fairly warm, but it was a nice warm. We're used to hot, so I can imagine though in the summer now over there how hot it'd be. I'm beating up here, and it's into our winter. Uh, well couple of days off actual winter but you know towards the start of winter end of autumn and uh, but yeah you guys would be would be finding it fairly sweltery right now getting into your summer yeah oh scooter scooter yeah he's good he's good he's an old fella now you know he's he's getting on and we give him injections into his knees for arthritis and <laughs> the thing is, he's his own worst enemy. He loves his Kong ball. He's up in the deck at the moment, looking down. Um, it takes him a while to warm up in the mornings, especially through winter. But, but those injections help him, and he trots around like a puppy. But even without the injections, he just still loves chasing after his ball, and he's obsessed with it. Uh, he gets plenty of exercise for an old fella and he's still going strong. He's a good dog, very good dog. And he has left the toads alone that lately, which has been good. And through winter, the toads die out and they go into hibernation anyway. These are the poisonous toads that he does tend to, uh, tend to get sometimes, and uh, which isn't good for him. But he has stayed away from that. Maybe it is because he's getting wiser and older, but uh, yeah, yeah, he's happy. He's happy and he's a good, Good dog, gets plenty of love, plenty of smack eyes, plenty of good food, and uh, got a little jacket for him this winter, just to put on on those really cold nights. And we thought, oh, that might annoy him, because he's a fairly much an outdoor dog. Doesn't come in a lot, sometimes he does. Um, and then he sits on the cat's bed. But, but there, yeah, he didn't, he, he liked the coat and he snuggled up in his bed. It's not like he's out in the out, out elements, he's just against the back door and he looks in all the time um, on it when he's sitting on his bed. But yeah, 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 he's a, he's a great dog, really good dog. I went through it last week about how we found him and that's a good story and uh, it's a good metaphor for life too, giving someone a chance um, and understanding that we're not all the same and that sometimes you can get Plenty of good diamonds in the rough that you didn't expect. And you can be really pleasantly surprised giving, you know, in that case, a really hyperactive dog a chance. And he turned into, yes, he is a bit obsessive, but he's not hard to look after and he's so clever. Probably the smartest dog we've ever had. Jack Russell crossed with a Border Collie. And uh, yeah, really good. Really good dog. He's looking at me now all strange because he knew I was talking about him. <clears throat> Not used to the live chat, just thanks. Yeah, well, thanks, Kevin. 
Um, I wish I could give you a whole heap of advice on live chatting and all that. The fact is, I'm used. I'm not used to this either. This is really new for me. I'm really enjoying it, but it stresses me a bit. The live thing, getting it right, and um, making sure that it doesn't go down, and getting the connections going, and trying to work out the live chat. I'm getting better at it slowly, but I'm still missing quite a bit. And but like I said, practice makes perfect. Sometimes you just got to get into it which is what I always like to say, and I practice what I preach. And just like boating, I had no clue at all driving a boat. We've had ups and downs with it, but it's been a ton of fun. But it's opened up all these new windows and lots of fun with the boys. But if I was to say, well, there's a little tiny spider on me. But if I was to say, look, um, I, I'm, I've never done boating before, it's too dangerous. Um, I'm afraid that I might have an accident or something like that. Well, and not do it, you know, letting fear hold me back. Well, then I wouldn't have learned all that and started to have fun in different types of areas that I would never have thought of with myself and the family. It's the same with the garden, you know. Just when I first started growing things, I'll just get rid of this fella. When I first started growing things, I, um, I didn't have a whole clue and I made lots of mistakes. Heaps of errors, but I didn't, buy, I didn't worry about it. Um, you, some might say I you know, wasted some seed here, wasted some money, um, built garden beds that were wrong, but just evolved and learnt from those mistakes. It's best learning from other people's mistakes you know uh, doing some research but it's also it's also good just jumping in and learning from your own mistakes yeah I'm not saying like the boating analogy that you just get a boat and then don't do anything and don't do any research and just drive off into the ocean well that'd be silly but I mean you know don't let don't let that type of don't let fear hold you back which is a great saying that I just love but also you know take care I have to put that caveat in there. William Tan, thanks mate. G'day Margaret from Canada. <laughs> Didn't think there was such a thing as a small spider in Australia. <laughs> well, I tell you what, there are some whoppers around. And they do give me the heebie-jeebies. I wouldn't have it hovering on my arm if it was any bigger than, say, this bottle top. G'day from South Florida. There's a lot of Floridians, isn't there? Similar climate type of thing. Can't wait to get back to America when all of this CV is done and dusted and everyone's all squirted up so that we can just not care anymore. We'll organize a get together at a nice bar somewhere, maybe a few, and just um, use it through social media and just yeah, sit around, have a few beers and, and have a good chat. That'd be nice. Wenda, hi from South Africa. Love South Africa too. Been there, yeah, twice twice quite extensively because my sister used to live over there with her with her husband and so we went over there when they got married and also another time just for a for a holiday fantastic a similar you know it's like Australia there's different zones and different climates and different heights and levels altitudes that have 
make it you know all different types of of uh, growing climates but in general it's very similar to the subtropical um, Australia or, or from Brisbane down to Sydney a bit like sort of Durban down to the Cape Yes, Janet, I'd come, I'd go to Texas too, you bet, uh, get some, get a big cowboy hat and I don't want a stereotype or anything, but uh, I get, eat a big steak and go uh, out to a ranch and that'd be pretty cool. Deborah, do I hand water my tomatoes? Usually, I usually do. Um, only because I like to control the amount of water those types of plants get. And I generally don't grow a whole lot of tomatoes. They're sort of in groups. And so it's not hard to hand water them. Because especially in winter time here when we grow the tomatoes mainly, you've got to check. And depending on the medium and the type of soil you have, being raised bed garden, a lot of my beds are slightly different. So I do the finger test and I test down and I water as appropriate because you don't want to overwater, especially tomatoes or underwater for that matter, because inconsistent water is what tomatoes hate. And especially as they're starting to crop. And Kevin had a great example in his last video about tomatoes that started splitting. And he had a few different scenarios, which was interesting. And uh, I've talked about that before as well. So consistent watering is good. You don't want to bog your tomatoes down, otherwise they won't grow very well. And you don't want to stress them out, otherwise they won't grow good fruit. And they might even drop fruit. So, and apart from that, if you're inconsistent with the watering, letting it dry out too much and then watering, and the, your tomatoes might split and they won't grow great either. So yeah, consistent watering, not over watering, and not under. I guess that's what I mean. I said that about a thousand times, didn't I? Thanks, Amanda. Cool sticker. Look at that, number one. <laughs> oh, jeez. How's the duck pond going? I, I couldn't catch the name. The, yeah, no, it's going good, good. The oh, duck pond, as in the actual dam, it's full, but it has a leak in it. But it's full because we get a lot of runoff at this time of year and it'll take a while to dry out. So the ducks are loving it. The actual duck pond experiment that I've got going down there with the taro and the arrowhead growing out of it, well, they're about that big now. Nice and green, even though it's dappled shade, even though we're, cut, we're in winter and it's colder down there and they're not getting as much sun and heat, still growing really well. I think that's going to be a good video overall and a good experiment once I get to harvesting stage and that multiplies in that bed. But yeah, so both ponds are good. So for those who don't know, uh, I used to have a raised uh, aquaponic type bed, which I turned into a internal duck pond in, a, in our poultry pen. So when the ducks were locked up, they could go up this ramp and they could have a swim and play in that water. And I'd have to empty it out all the time, probably every month or more, or, or more depending on the amount of ducks that used it, because it just gets smelly and yucky. Um, so what I did, once we got the dam going uh, and they didn't need that anymore and I pulled down all that extra wire and I refurbished our poultry pens and everything down there, got a better snake proof and all that. What was I going to do with that raised pond, that aquaponic pond? And I thought, well, <clears throat> let's do some water plants in there. And that's what, that's what I did, planted some taro, planted some arrowhead and wondered how it'd go and it's going really well. Used some volcanic rock in there, used a lot of the old fertilizer, soil, duck mash that was left in there and that's where they're going to get a lot of nutrients from so I hadn't had to put any actual fertilizer or nutrients in there. I put some extra soil in there and that's about it. <clears throat> Yeah, I've got 
really should be reading those names. <clears throat> but I, I have a dedicated asparagus bed, which I want to expand. And because at the moment I have it half asparagus. These are one of my really old ones. Half asparagus and half ginger I've been planting in there. For many years now, I've been planting ginger on the other side. And, I, and I'm thinking, I just want that whole bed to be asparagus because I'm finding that we're not harvesting enough as, asparagus because you've got to also leave some of it grow on at the end of the season so that it gets the energy into the crown so that you can have it next year. Uh, it's dying back now in winter and then we have asparagus in spring and through summer. And that towards the end of summer, you'll let it grow out and get that energy again. But I'm finding that I'd like more asparagus. We love eating it. It's really a fantastic veggie. And it's so great because it's a perennial. You can leave it in one garden bed for 25, 30 years and it'll just keep coming back for you every season. So it's such an easy crop to grow. And so what I'm going to do is fill the rest of that bed up and uh, maybe for some other different varieties but we'll see and regardless I just want to have the whole bed dedicated to asparagus so yes that's a good idea <clears throat> G'day mate we're in Oz oh, we're, we're located just north of Brisbane, about 40 kilometres north of Brisbane, up the highway, up the Bruce Highway. <clears throat> Greg Hemig, Greg, can you do an episode on the birds in your yard? I could. I'm not sure how how many people would enjoy that. I mean, I, I put birds in my content from time to time because they make lots of relevant points. But a one video dedicated with showing the birds might be best on my second channel, which is a good idea. I'll note that down. So thanks for that suggestion. But that's that would be a good video for that self-sufficient me too channel, I think, rather than this one here. Because a lot of people have signed up on this main channel for those types of top 10 videos, the top 10 things, and um, grow, to ton, grow a ton, and some spe specifically edited videos. And I, I've got to acknowledge that. I've got to be fair to that um, and try to give people what the majority want. Not all the time, but yeah. But a lot of the time, that's what a lot of people have signed up for. So, pardon me, that's why I created Self Sufficient Me Too. And I am, have got a build up, and I'm going to schedule them of, of short clips and other clips. Like I released one yesterday of just building the latest, or well, latest, building a small mini cage um, greenhouse. This is a really good little strong greenhouse that I purchased. And it's not sponsored or anything, or even affiliatized, but I really like it. And I didn't need anything big, because a lot of the veggies we grow, we just sow direct, or I have them sowed, and I put them out in the open anyway, sow them in, in pots and containers. But occasionally, I want to protect some of the seedlings, and I'm thinking if I had a little mini grow place, I could experiment in that, and maybe grow tomatoes, longer in the season under a bit of shade or I could use it for several other things or I could use it for starting seedlings or if they're getting targeted by animals or birds or pests I could put those seedlings in there and have them protected uh, so those type of videos like it went for about 15 minutes and I didn't speak a lot in it I just showed me putting it together I cheekily um, did a hashtag ASMR on there because I I didn't speak much in there, but um, <laughs> there's a lot of banging and drill work, so I'm not sure how ASMRing that was.
Asparagus grow well with tomatoes. You're probably best off growing it in its own bed because asparagus can grow quite big when you're growing it out. And one might outshade the other two. It depends if your tomato grows big first, it's, out, it's shading out. Asparagus doesn't do too bad in part shade, you know, if you have to. Um, but that's like ginger. It doesn't grow too bad in part shade either. But it's still best in full sun. That's what I've found. So you'd probably best limit those other taller crops to its own space as well. I mean, as your tomatoes grow up you can, and you're trimming the base of them and you get quite a bit of light in there, it's good to grow smaller veggies like salad crops, spinach and lettuce and those type of things, the leafy crops underneath those crops, those taller crops because you save space. Garden, state garden. What do you do to keep the weeds down in the asparagus section? Well, I just keep weeding it, uh, weed as much as possible. Once it starts growing out, it does shade out a lot of those weeds. Uh, that's at that growing out stage where they have the big the big ferns come out, and you let it grow on. But as you're harvesting and early in the season, if you've mulched it, like I mulch quite thick at the end of the season. I give it some fertilizer, mulch it, and then leave it rest. And then in spring when it comes up, it pushes through that mulch. And that thick mulch stops a lot of the other weeds coming through. So that's a good thing about mulching on top of your asparagus. So that works, um, but the only other way is the physical grab them out when you can walk past the bed and because it can be a quite a sparse crop initially when it starts to grow and you're, you're growing out the um, you know the stems for whatever bit of word I can't remember the the name of them but they can be quite sparse and you can get weeds competing with it go through and weed them when they're small and that way yeah you should be right Tanya, if, you're, if, you're, if your bok choy is bolting already, like from a very small plant, it, you, might have, you might be planting it when it's, when it's way too hot, or you might be underwatering it. Uh, if the conditions and the climate's right at that particular, where you, wherever you are, well then I would sow some more seed and uh, give it another go, because it might just have been a little bit of an extra warm day or might have been under a bit of stress and it's throwing seed. Once your, your plants start to go by bolt to seed, they can get quite bitter and not as good. You can let maybe a few of them go to seed and if you've got time in the season, replant them. But, uh, but yeah, that's what I'd suggest do. If it's still the right time for that crop, just throw some more seed in and give it a go. Bok choy grows real fast. See you, Craig. 3 a.m. there. Off to bed, I understand. Ricky Baker, what do you do for a large ant problem? Multiple ant hills and 50 inch by 60 inch garden. Yeah, I, I'm, I don't know. I'm hesitant to, to advise on any chemical use unless you can get some type of maybe organic remedy for it. I have fixed an ant problem once by digging up a tree that had a persistent ant nest in there. 
and I dug it up and I smashed the ant's nest to pieces and, uh, and, and then replanted the tree in that spot. That was actually the honey murcot. It took a while to, for it to come good, but now it's a growing into a really nice tree. This was years ago. Um, it's pretty extreme and it was risky because I was digging up a young fruit tree to get to the to get the root ball out so I could get rid of the ants nest um, so you could till it you could dig it all up messy lots of ants everywhere boiling water um, I don't know but I, I personally I don't like to advise using um, chemical remedies although I have in the past I've got to be I've got to be honest um, a bit of ant sand here and there but That'd be on concrete pathways or uh, in a really urban type area, but not around food crops. In our garden, there's, it's full of ants, but it, I mean, it's not like ants everywhere, but yeah, there are, but it's not like squillions of big ants nest in one of our, in one of our garden beds. If that was to happen, like if I'm digging in any garden bed, I'll get ants on me, but it's not like swarming or big nests, there probably is maybe down below. Because see, that they, they eat the caterpillars and they eat the bad bugs. They can farm aphids, which can be bad. So if I've got them in the orchard, I'll use sort of organic remedies to get rid of the ants so that the aphids then can get attacked by predator insects. Um, but yeah, if they were in the garden bin, they were annoying me and like a big ants nest, well then I would get rid of them. Um, I'd dig it all out, make life hard for them. Fire ants would be a different story. We haven't got them here yet, but I, I've heard they have landed, they are in Queensland uh, in some parts. Ho hopefully they'll never come here. But if they were a real menace pest of an ant, well then I would find out what the pros use and get them eradicated from the property. So I'm not completely adverse to chemicals. I just hate using them and only use them as a last resort. But if they're normal garden ants, I wouldn't worry too much. There you go, there's lots of people coming up with remedies in the in the chat section so that's great G'day Caperman from the Netherlands. Noah, am I ever planning to do a tomato tunnel trellis go uh, again? Yeah, yeah, I like that setup. I will be. Uh, just got to get rid of that pumpkin vine and those gourds at the moment. I really have let it run its course probably too long, but it's still producing. It's hard to get rid of a really good plant even though you're getting sick of eating it but yeah I will because I like that tunnel trellis tomato thing and I want to grow tried some different varieties and grow them over maybe maybe next season we'll, we'll use those garden beds up get them all ready and full of organic matter and lots more compost and we'll do tomatoes again yeah next next winter I don't have a stall, Janine, no. Don't have a stall. I just give away to family and friends and what we don't give away and we can't eat, we try to preserve. If not, we'll compost. 
put back into the garden. Spicy pumpkin chutney. Sounds nice, Pamela. I might have a look at that. Advice for plants in extreme heat, all I can think of is try growing under shade cloth, a light shade cloth. Sometimes the ambient heat beats you anyway, uh, no matter what, but it can help to grow. You, you can see commercial growers do this all the time. They'll grow in hot climates and they'll have these big tunnels, they'll aerate them, fan them, and they'll have a, a shade cloth over the top depending on the conditions they'll either use a 30 percent or 50 or 70 type of percentage and blocks out a certain amount of sun so i would try that if i was in az and arizona and it was really hot desert like conditions kind of thing i would definitely be putting shade cloth over these raised garden beds i did an example on how to on how to do that on a few videos ago but it can be as simple as you don't even have to enclose them. If you haven't got a, a real problem with pests or anything, you can just use the shade cloth. Um, just like put up a frame and just do a whole row and just have it on the top so that it, the sun at the worst time of day isn't beating down on those plants. And then when it's in the morning or afternoon, it's not as hot those plants are still getting a bit of extra sun when they need it. So perhaps that could work. Um, but I'd experiment with shade, shade cloth. How many inches of compost, Glenn, do I recommend? Um, I would, let's say, let's say if you've just got a flat garden bed and it needs a little bit of work, well, I'd go say, yeah, a couple of inches of compost on top and I'd lightly dig that in to the top layer of the soil. You can just layer it if you want. But I think digging it in and mixing it into the top layer of soil was probably a good thing. Nice and light dig in. Probably a couple of inches all over the whole garden bed. And that should give it enough extra structure, water holding, extra compost fertiliser, that type of thing. I mean, if it's a really sandy bed, like, and very new and terrible soil, you might need more. It's hard to gauge. You do the squishy hands test. If you get a handful of soil, damp soil, and you can squish it and it holds together, but it's not like clay and gets all sticky, and then when you touch it, it falls apart quite easily, well then, that's a good sign that the soil holds together nicely and can retain moisture and nutrients. If you squish it together and you open your hand up and it just falls apart, it's too sandy. If you squish it together and it's all sticky and water oozes out of it, um, and, it and then you try to move it and it, it just sort of slides around like you're making a clay pot at um, home ec, well, then that soil's too heavy. You need to work in organic matter, maybe some gypsum, that type of thing to break up that clay. Likewise, if it's too sandy, you might have a heap of organic matter, manures and compost to get that soil a little heavier. I've been trying to get a good balance in these beds here. The initial soil was really light and sandy and terrible. I've tried to improve it over the last few years, bit by bit, compost here and that. It's still not great, so I ended up using quite a bit of cow manure. 
letting the beds rest. And they're okay, but they are a bit heavy in places I've noticed. So it'll be interesting to see. So far, the crops are growing well in them, but there are places in the bed where I've noticed when I've been digging around that have been fairly heavy still. Maybe I've overdone it a bit too much in some areas, but that's better than having it heavy all the way through or too light all the way through. But we'll get there. I mean, making your soil in your garden bed isn't instant. It's, it takes time to get that medium going. And then it can take quite a long time for it to grade too. So that's why it's good once you get it to that good live soil stage where it's really good, then you just need to maintain it bit by bit. Sometimes you don't need to add much compost or anything at all to it over a season. Maybe you know, your plants haven't sucked that much out of the soil and you can get several seasons out of it. But you just keep an eye on it and add where appropriate to keep those beds going nicely once you've got them to a good stage. Brian about nematodes <clears throat> my best advice is rest the bed and starve the little bastards out that is the best if, if your beds riddled with them and you're planting a tomato or cabbage or something like that in there and it dies off quickly because the nematodes get into the root system you see the the root systems all knotted and everything like that because the eel worms get in there well the best way is to not grow anything in that bed at all and there's another way but not grow anything in it at all and then over six months or so they'll they should be starved out the other way is to maybe grow a crop of marigolds in there and it could look really pretty too and that can attract pollinators and insects into your garden and good bugs and then the marigolds itself gives off a they're, they're sort of a repellent for nematodes and there's like a natural pesticide inside marigolds then you can dig those marigolds in still when they're not died off or anything still when they're growing okay so maybe you're sort of how you're sort of digging them in when they're still looking all right so they're nice and lush still so that's going to add a good green manure crop green manure to your soil and just go break down and feed good things like worms and improve your soil but at the same time it should kill off and deter nematodes by digging that that marigold crop in so they're the two ways that i would approach it and that i've done in the past but by far the best way i've found is just by resting that bed for ages six months or more growing in other beds crop rotation or growing crops that don't get attacked by nematodes and then you'll find that they they eventually starve themselves out you I, I believe you can get good and bad nematodes so we're talking about the bad nematodes <clears throat> Koro, Koru, should we refrigerate extra, extra seeds? How do I protect corn from earwigs? Ah, uh, don't know about the second one. Is it uh, is earwigs the the grub that gets into the top of the? of the corn cob you can inspect that and if you see any any like if you see any grubs getting into the top caterpillars and that then you can uh, you can squish them before they make any damage you could use pyethrum uh, that should help it's a, a a natural a natural pesticide um, I don't like using it but at a work you know at in worst case scenario, if your crop is getting targeted and destroyed by a bug like that, well then, perhaps you could use it. It doesn't, as long as you're not spraying it when there's bees and that around and predator insects, because it, it, it's indiscriminate still. So it's not recommended, but um, always organic control is always best if you can. 
even though pyrethrum is, is seen as organic and not that harmful it's still still a last resort I don't generally use it here very much at all um, I can't remember the last time I used it actually but yeah keep an eye on the crop maybe squish it with your fingers if you can maybe use exclusion you can that could help um, excluding the whole garden bed a bit difficult for corn I understand because it would be a fair bit of covering but yeah, try all those types of methods what was the other question oh, refrigerating your seeds <clears throat> you don't have to you could uh, keep them in a nice cool spot I keep most of our seeds in our cupboard in the study and it's cool enough in there keeps a consistent temperature and that's fine we have a filing cabinet actually and I sort through them from A to Z and that works pretty well but yeah you can refrigerate them I know refrigerating certain seeds can help with germination but um, but you don't have to unless you're in a really hot and humid area and you've got nowhere else to store them but thank you Thank you, Coro. Riggs, Lambourne. Do I grow watermelon? I haven't grown watermelon for a while because it doesn't tend to grow great here. Uh, I, it's a bit like the pumpkin. You know, you've got to have the space and let it go <clears throat> maybe I could try a couple of smaller varieties we don't eat a lot of watermelon so it's not something I think about a lot and the fruit fly tend to be a real pain at getting stuck into those types of fruits I, I think it from memory it has to grow into our spring which is when the fruit fly come out whereas I can get away with it with the pumpkins generally they're because they grow through the cooler time of the year but I haven't ruled it out it's something I have got some watermelon seed that I purchased the other day that um, that I will have another another go at and why not but I haven't grown a lot of it to be honest no I don't know how to get rid of poison ivy. You might have to just pull it out. Or use one of those, <clears throat> if you want to do it organically, use one of those flamethrower things. Go along. Maybe a really high potent vinegar, like the 8% stuff. Spray that on it. That'd, that'd work too, as a good another organic solution. G'day Danny. Tuscan AZ. Bruno from Brazil. G'day. Mary from Texas. Tucson, Arizona. KP from Florida, another Floridian. Jack from KC. Lots of people on the poison ivy thing. <laughs> Mm-mm. 
<clears throat> All right, well, I think we might uh, wrap it up. I know there's still a thousand of you watching here, which is fantastic, but uh, I've got to get cracking. I've got nine, well, seven more of these beds to build. I've got to make content, I've got to release a video this weekend, and uh, I've got plenty of things on, plenty of work to do. Plus, this sun is starting to beat down the back of my neck. I've got sunscreen on, but by crikey, I'm starting to really feel a burn. But the heat, it's probably not burning, but um, yeah, I better get out, maybe give the camera a rest as well before it goes south on me. But I'm glad that it held up, so that's cool. I am getting better wireless coming soon, which will let us go around and do some walk arounds and trial some different things. So maybe the first half we go for a walk around the garden and that'd be pretty cool. I could go anywhere I want. I'd love that. And then the second half is q and I think that'd, that'd be really cool. But, uh, but for now, I think we call it quits and, uh, and it's nice, nice to call it, call it quits. Um, as uh, over a thousand so quit while I'm ahead <laughs> and I uh, really appreciate you guys tuning in today I, I really enjoy these live streams because it's just a I I was pretty like I've said plenty of times now I was fairly fearful of it uh, because of the technology side of it mainly um, and you just don't know how people will receive me um and ah and answering questions and talking about various subjects in the backyard and it seems like it's been received really well and I'm enjoying chatting I'm enjoying this instant feedback and the the instant um, communication with with you guys so I really like it so I'm gonna keep this going you know obviously there might be times when I might be sick or something like that and I might not be able to get a live stream in in the week I'll keep trying to have this regular spot on a Thursday about 9 30 my time seems to work really well and yeah the rest of you um, for now anyway unless I change my timings if you can't catch it uh, you're watching this back on not live but I still appreciate you tuning in as well and having a replay of the chats I'd recommend that because it is really good and I've missed quite a bit babbling on to the camera but I go back and I have a bit of a skim through and get some good pointers and have a bit of a laugh and have a read. So I'd advise you do that as well as you watch the video. But I appreciate you watching after the fact as well. But anyway, thanks a lot for tuning in. Make sure you get into it. Remember, be self-sufficient in something and look and see the earth through her eyes. And that can solve so many of your problems by thinking that way cheers thanks a lot for watching guys bye for now oh there's the last super chat here little foot with aloe pecker hello I, I really butchered that up but uh, no thank you thank you very much no question but appreciate that. Bye, wing. Ciao. Thanks, Chris. You saw another great show. Chris Castaldo. Thanks, Dal's Homestead. Bye, Levy. Thanks, Kuru. Thanks, Tony. Later. Bye-bye, Mandy. Thank you. Bye from Sweden. Mark from Hawaii. <laughs> cool glasses, mate. <laughs> Thanks, Annette, from USA. Bye. Oh, we got another...
quick rip in here, super chat. I'll have to mention it. Zachary Bird, Texas. Any tips for Texans heading into our 150 Fahrenheit, 40 plus degree Celsius summer? <sighs> Wear sunscreen, mate. Wear it. Otherwise, you'll get old and wrinkly like me before your time. I wish I knew that tip when I was in my teens and yeah, halfway through my military career. And get to the beach if you can. Radio. Okay, that's enough. See us.